All right. So without much further ado, it looks like we have a good group of people. Uh, Paul, thanks for joining us, man. I really appreciate having you on. Hey, th thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So guys, you know, thanks for joining. Uh, go ahead and get started again. This is the OIT VoIP, OIT Partner First webinars. It's where we showcase industry leaders, you know, the thought leaders, the people providing valuable services, people that are helping us make our MSPs, our ISPs, our telcos better and more valuable to our clients. And it's especially in Paul's case, keeping us and our clients safe um, from the pitfalls of, of compliance issues and regulation issues. Uh, those of you that are OIT VoIP partners and selling our services, you know all too well about the, the pitfalls of regulations. And, you know, if you go astride of, of the best practices, you, you know the perils you could be in. So, you know, there's companies like Paul that help us navigate those waters and help us do so with grace and uh, with great success uh, financially as well. Uh, Paul, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hey, thanks a lot again for having me today. My name is Paul Redding. Uh, my title is Vice President of Partner Engagement and Cybersecurity for Compliancy Group. Uh, just a brief background about me. I actually owned an MSP slash business solution provider for almost 15 years based out of Memphis. We were a compliancy group partner, arguably one of the first resellers. So I kind of reinvented my business around the solution that we're going to talk about today. I took over the channel in September of 2019. So I am relatively new to the in-house team and uh, kind of new to this side of the table, if you will, you know, the vendor section as opposed to sitting out there in the service provider or server uh, service provider audience. New to this side of the house, but not new to the industry. A lot of tons exactly. of experience, and uh, <laughs> and we're going to get the benefits of that. Uh, before we get started, you guys know I love to start with polls, so we're going ahead and uh, going to start off a poll. Uh, first poll is how many of you guys are uh, doing HIPAA compliance today, right? How many of you guys are actually doing um, going out and 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 it could be any compliance services, really. You know, those of us in FINRA, FERPA, FDA, SOC space, but you know, today we're going to focus on on HIPAA specifically. How many guys are doing that? Are you actively marketing it? Are you actively, you know, doing your scans and all that stuff? And, you know, do the clients know? Because one of the things I've learned about MSPs is we're great at offering services. We're not great at communicating them. And we had another partner first webinar about that. So it looks like 58% of you, 59% of you are actively marketing and offering HIPAA compliance today. So that's great. Uh, we need to get that other 41% of you doing so as well, because, HIPAA doesn't take any uh, take any prisoners, right, Paul? It's uh, it's no. pretty much everybody's at risk if you're in that space. Yeah, one of the kind of crazy things about the law is it's literally written to cover everyone from the smallest single person provider like a chiropractor all the way up to you know L.A. County or you know major hospital chains throughout the country. So everybody's kind of under the same focus and under the same gun. And it's uh, and we've seen you know. There's no, uh, those penalties that have happened for failing to, failure to comply. I'm sure you have plenty of data on that, but those fines are hefty. They're, it's not a small thing, right? Yeah, the average fine is like a million dollars. And in reality, the failure rate we'll kind of talk about today is over 90%. So not only are the fines extremely punishing, but people are getting it wrong day in wow. and day out over and over again. And, and uh, you're going to share with us how you help avoid exactly those pitfalls. So with that, I'll go ahead and let you take over uh, with your presentation. And please, let's get started. Awesome. Thank you very much. I do appreciate that. I'll get my little screen share going here. Hope everybody can see that. Again, my name is Paul Redding. I, uh, like I said, I come from the service provider world. Um, my, my background, I always like to tell people you hear that cybersecurity title right there. Those who can't do teach, that's me. I understand and translate nerd into English extremely well, but I'm not like an engineer background. So I fit more of the mold of the CEO of a lot of the uh, MSPs out there rather than let's say an engineer. Uh, just to kind of fill in who we are, uh, Compliancy Group has been in the circuit about 15 years. So on this side of the channel, we're actually working with service providers only for maybe the last four. 
But we come out of the medical space. As a matter of fact, compliancy group were, were large scale HIPAA auditors. So back to those organizations that we did before, think like in LA County, you know, nine hospitals, 1200 individual clinics. Our solution, our methodology was actually built to deliver service to that level and size of an organization. But early on, we realized that the small business market was tremendously underserved and made up, believe it or not, the massive port, like the, the biggest section of compliance, uh, compliance based businesses. So in that 15 year history, if you take a look at what we've done, we've worked with businesses of every size and shape all throughout the world to help them achieve and maintain HIPAA compliance. As a matter of fact, if you see on our screen here, the, our seal of compliance, which you'll see displayed here, that's considered something of an industry standard in healthcare. Over 40 of your major medical associations endorse this as the way that their members display and maintain HIPAA compliance. By using our methodology and by displaying that HIPAA seal of compliance, they show the world what they're achieving and that they do everything required under the law to comply. Um, in the MSP channel, we're kind of considered the subject matter experts around compliance itself. There are many, many companies that are delivering fabulous security solutions aimed at medical businesses, but we are one of the only ones in the space that actually touches everything else beyond the security, all the other things that it takes to really achieve compliance with the law. So I assume everybody is kind of here for the same purpose, but let's go ahead and set expectations. You know, we understand that today the world is changing rapidly. This whole COVID thing is a mess for all of us, right? So as a service provider, you're, you're really tasked with doing a couple of things no matter what happens in the economy. You need to grow your client base and God knows you need to maintain the ones that you've already got. And the goal for that is to build recurring revenue, right? We all realize that project-based work is not gonna sustain us forever. Look what's happening now. Suddenly there's no going out and changing switches and boots on the ground. You've gotta have a relationship with clients that makes you a piece of their business and keeps that revenue coming back in year after year. To do that, obviously you'll raise your profits. And the biggest thing about this is if you take a look at, you know, I think you said it was like 58% of these guys are out there actively selling compliance at some level, they are different than the other 40% that's not touching this. They don't feel exclusively like a typical provider. You're giving a bigger solution. So that's what we're here to talk about today. What we're advocating the delivery of, what ultimately our partners and like me as a former service provider, what we were selling is compliance as a solution. You'll notice that I did not say as a service, the reason for this is because our take on it is that a service is designed to fix a specific issue. So let's say, for example, a firewall is a service. It provides a needed layer of network security. The problem is that for regulated businesses, they don't have like one or two or three little tech issues. I mean, those exist for them, but that's not their problem. Their problem is much larger. As a matter of fact, if you are under, say, HIPAA or other regulatory acts, what you really have is a business problem as a whole. That problem consists of tech stuff. It consists of legal things. It cons consists of privacy and administrative functions within your organization. So the service provider that's delivering CAS, true compliance as a solution, they're addressing all of those in one fell swoop. It makes them different, again, than the other service providers around them. And from their customer's perspective, it makes them critically important to the organization. The other thing that it does for you, though, really is for years, all service providers, I think, have been making suggestions that our clients just either don't understand or are unwilling to pay for. For example, advanced security services. We all know antivirus isn't enough anymore. By leveraging the fact that there are regulatory acts that these people have to comply with, we, tra we transform your security suggestions into mandates under the law. We justify everything that you've told that client before. So, so I want to stop you real ahead. quick, Paul, because yeah. you mentioned something that, that, uh, that brings up a, a thought for me. So you mentioned sometimes things they don't want to pay for. And, and that's one of the reasons I've always been a huge fan of regulated industries. It's not just us saying these things. It's that, that compliance authority, right? Whether it's FDA, FINRA, FERPA, it doesn't matter. But somebody else is saying, you need to do these things to be compliant. And if not, there's penalties for doing so. Um, but we always get an, an MSP 
there's there's so many variations of MSP, right? Of mm -hmm. am I doing full on MSP or am I just doing project base or or uh, break fix face? And I, I have to say that the question that comes up the most often when we talk about this is who needs to be compliant, right? Because there's plenty of these break fix shops that are working in a regulated client space, but they're not the MSP. Are they still subject to these rules? That is a fabulous question. So the way that the law is written, and, and this, it, it really changed for all of us in the provider vendor space in 2015. So the law is written, we have what's called the omnibus rule come into effect. After the inception of the omnibus rule and a brief window of kind of a, a, a space where it hadn't been really uh, enforced yet, now we live in the world where this is day to day. Under omnibus, what it says is everyone who conceivably can interact with PHI through transport, through storage, through incidental interaction, all of us have to comply with the HIPAA law. So if your client is in healthcare and you are involved at any level in the remediation of the gaps associated with their risk assessment, with the support of the users involving their local data, email transport, any of that stuff, then yes, you actually have to, you are under the HIPAA law yourself. What you are called is a business associate. And so you are not only required to adhere to the law, but there should be a contract in place between you and every healthcare organization you service. And that's called a business associate. Agreement. Wow. So everyone's at risk. Do your due diligence, guys. I, I've always been a big fan of do client, you know, practice client selection. Don't just offer service to absolutely everybody. You're in a risky space. A lot is on your shoulders. Pick the right clients so you can offer the right service. And the ones you can't, you know, we throw around fire your clients all the time. I, I'm not trying to advocate firing all your clients. We'd all be broke if we did. But I'm saying be smart about your client selection so that you never have to be forgiving in the kind of solution you offer. I couldn't possibly more. Now, I will say that actually segues pretty well into where we were going to go with this next one, is that we just talked a lot about the fear, let's say the risk and the, the fines and all that stuff associated with it. it. It should not be overlooked that the purpose of this law is not to punish American society, right? They didn't put this together and write all this so that they can punish you for being a doctor or for serving doctors. As a matter of fact, the goal of the law is to improve the practices that are involved in our healthcare as, as an organ or as a nation and to benefit those businesses. So if you think about it, what the law is requiring is that you as an organization look at all your risks, identify them very clearly and fix what's wrong. I don't care if you're in healthcare or you, know, you, you cut grass. If every year you take a look at your business and you say, what's wrong in my organization? What are the places where I can really fall down and fail? What are my risks and how do I fix them? You as an organization will function better. How many businesses out there really overlook the fact that if they had to go home for three or four weeks, they did not know how to function from their house. That's just a part of assessing your risk and understanding that stuff happens. What's the Geico expression? Life comes at you fast. The second piece of HIPAA compliance that they're really asking you to do is tell your employees what their job is. You have to create policies and procedures administratively inside, and you have to train your employees and actually expect them to do what you say. Again, it's not designed to be punitive. If you take a look at this, if your employees know what their job is clearly, they've been well-trained and they understand it, ultimately they're gonna be happier. We are not content if we are confused. If we are under pressure and we don't know what our job is and we don't understand how security and compliance relates to us, then we resent it and feel uncomfortable. And so by improving that environment, you make your employees happier. And the natural result of that is that your clients, in the case of medical groups, this is your patients, but let's talk about the service provider, right? Same thing, your clients are gonna stay with you. They're gonna be more loyal because they realize you as an organization are well-built, you function correctly, you're security conscious, your delivery is clean. So ultimately, what you've done is, and this is a stat that HHS shows, we actually see that businesses that are HIPAA compliant and that do comply with the regulatory acts that they're required to are 15% on average more profitable. You, again, you're looking at your business every year, you're fixing what's wrong, and your, your employees know what their job is. I think it can be argued that all, all of us, whether we're in healthcare or not, should be doing exactly what the law requires there, right? So if you do this, again, like I said, fear, urgency, and doubt only goes so far. Think about what we've ultimately done. You've come in, 
you talk to an organization, if they get compliant, if they fix the stuff that we're going to talk about here and build that culture of compliance inside, you have really helped them fix this organization. You've helped them write a ship. In a lot of cases, they didn't know how far off they were until they started down this path. And you'd be amazed at how many times they'll come back to you later and thank you. Because look, just from, the, let's say, the reality that there's a lot of roll-ups happening in the healthcare space and private equity has been snatching these businesses up. If you're looking for an exit strategy, believe me, one of the first thing those business-to-business -business buyers are going to look at is your compliance and how you achieve compliance. So by delivering this, you've really improved that business. Like I said, yeah, the fear is not to be ignored, but there's some really strong benefits to it just complying with the law. So while we go through this, I want to just kind of keep a couple of concepts in the front of your mind, okay? Number one, like you pointed it out, everybody in this room, if you're working with healthcare at all, everybody that's sitting here listening to us today, you are in healthcare and everything we're talking about applies to you as well. Understand that not every service provider is doing this. They don't all have a handle on it. Many of them, as a matter of fact, are misrepresenting how far they take their compliance services. So they're delivering security, but they call it compliance. If you do it right, you're one of a very few in a very crowded room delivering a very high value solution. So I, I want to ask a question there because if I understand it, the, the MSP's role here is not to say, you're compliant, you're not compliant. It's to assist in navigating those waters, bringing the, like, the right solutions into place so that it all plays together nicely, right? Whether it's policies, whether it's framework, whether it's security solutions, whether it's bringing on the right partners, but there's no MSP on the planet that can say, I deem you HIPAA compliant, you are. That doesn't exist. It's a facilitator, right? You know, the reality is that no organization on the planet can certify you for HIPAA compliance. That seal of compliance that we show in the beginning, it's validation that you've gone through our process. It's validation that you've put forth a good faith effort to comply, and that is what the law requires. Let's face it, security tools don't work. They work until somebody breaks them. If a nation state actor, a good enough hacker, somebody really wants you, they can get you. Breaches are going to happen. The CIA has been breached. The FBI has been breached. Every three-letter organization you can name has been a victim of some kind of attack. If you could buy your way out of it, then they would have. The, what we're being expected to do here is be able to demonstrate that you're trying and that you're doing all the things that are required under the law to prove that. So it's really about a system inside your organization. It's not about going to a client and saying, tomorrow I can make you 100% to the letter completely perfect across the board. It's an unrealistic expectation. Uh, I always say compliance is a marathon with no finish line. You just continue to run forever. And as long as you are running and you can prove you're doing it the right way, you won't fail an audit. Makes perfect sense. Thanks for explaining that. No, no problem. And the second thing that I would say here that, that we're really going to talk about today is that I am referring to compliance all the way through this conversation. We'll touch on the security pieces, but there's a really big difference between compliance and security and understanding that is critical to being able to deliver the right services. I love security tools. I'm a nerd at heart. So SOC and SIM and all these things, I eat that stuff up. I love to read about it. I love to understand it. The law doesn't call for any of it at all. It says implement an effective security plan. It's up to us to decide what that means for our clients. Okay. So again, we talk about why compliance would be sold by a service provider. Let's look at the security tools we were just talking about. SOC. SIM, EDR, MDR, your RMM tools, that business continuity suite that you're trying to get out there, the fact that your phone service is HIPAA compliant and you want to deliver that at a higher value because you've had to put all these kind of things in place yourself. The customer doesn't really understand that. They, 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 didn't, they didn't come to you to hear about all the nerd stuff, but by taking compliance and, and being able to easily demonstrate that there's a law that you have to follow just like they do, all this stuff is called out underneath this law, what is going to happen is it's ultimately going to justify all the things that we just talked about. So instead of you having to explain why the law does that for you and the client looks to you to implement the things that are needed to fix the issue. 
So for example, if you think about it, like I said, the law doesn't call out the need for a utility that specifically manages encryption on your devices. It does ask, however, for you to be able to prove that a stolen device was actually encrypted when it was stolen. The way that you have to do that are through these security tools that we're talking about here today. The law doesn't require a firewall specifically, but it does require monitoring, auditing, and detection, encryption. It requires the effect of the firewall. This is the same for every tool you can see. So we've got partners here that, you know, I'll, I'll call out one specifically, like Axiant is our customer. Instead of having to justify the need for Axiant's backup tool and try to explain to them that you really need to back that laptop up over there, it's very simple. The law says all that data can't be lost and you've got a fantastic utility that can save that for them. That's how the, the CAS really like justifies what you as a service provider are doing. So, just to call a couple of things out here, because I think these stats are very, very telling. You hear that I'm consistently talking about HIPAA through this presentation. This is not because we're not aware of GDPR and NIST and FERPA and all the things that, you know, other regulatory acts. As a matter of fact, rolling out this year, we've got a series of other frameworks that will be included in our product. But look at healthcare from the MSP perspective, okay? It's almost 30% of the US economy. In fact, 26% of the US economy falls into that healthcare category. Remember in the beginning of that question you asked me, I did not just say that 26% of the US economy is made up of doctors. All of us that are listening today, myself included as a service provider, if you work with healthcare, you fall into that box. You are in healthcare as well. The second thing that's really, really interesting about that, though, is while, let's say, manufacturing makes a huge portion of our economy, healthcare is almost all small business. So out of that massive 26%, 5 million of them fall right into the category that the MSP hunts in actively, right? The small privately held business that ranges from one or two users up to a couple of hundred. Healthcare is not made up of these massive tier one enterprises like a lot of other industries are. And then the other two things are kind of on the frightening side. Number one, that stat I gave earlier, Health and Human Services, which is the regulatory body responsible for creating and ultimately like issuing fines. HHS tells us that the failure rate over the, the lifespan of this law is 94%. So six out of 100 organizations that are audited actually pass their audit at all. This is where I'm going to call something out that's going to be a little self-serving and, and kind of point to something about compliance group. That seal of compliance that we talk about that we showed earlier, our clients that go through our process are issued that at the end. That means that you're a member of our audit response program. So if one of our clients is audited, we actually prepare the response for them and issue that to HHS. In our 15 year here history, given our size, we've been engaged in multiple federal audits at any given moment. That 94% failure rate does not apply to us. We have never ever had a client fail a federal audit of any form. This is not to say we haven't had clients with major breaches. It's not to say that we haven't had big problems happen. Bad stuff happens to good people. We have always and will continue to be able, always been able to and will continue to be able to prove their good faith under the, uh, under the law to comply. And by doing so, we prevent fines and failures for audits. Those stats are both equally terrifying and reassuring. <laughs> so. Right, right, right. We have Look, there is a way to do this. It's not, it's not impossible to achieve, but if you look at that 94% failure rate, it tells you that there has to be some major disconnect. There's no way that over nine out of 10 healthcare organizations in this country are willingly and knowingly violating this law. The stats are just too big. And then lastly, for everybody that thinks this can't happen to me, it doesn't happen to small organizations, guys, enforcement is up over 400%. Last year, we were just under a billion dollars worth of fines issued, and tons of them were issued to small businesses. So I it think does that, apply to the fine. I think that's super important. I mean, we hear it all the time. Oh, you know, and, and as MSPs, it's second nature to us. We hear the clients, oh, we're too small. We're not going to get hacked. We're not a target. And we will sit there and speak ad nauseum. Of course, you're a target. They're not looking for you, Bob. They're looking for any open IP on the internet, period. They're running their scans and they're seeing, okay, what are my attack vectors and getting in? Well, here, HSS, HSS is it the same thing? It, it's not a company size thing. They're just auditing, period. Um, Actually, how, well, how does the selection happen? How does that happen? 
That's, that's what I was going to say. Actually, the easiest way to understand where the audits come from is that any reported issue, potential breach, anything that's turned in, so a whistleblower, a, a disloyal patient, somebody that's upset, turns you in because they think they saw any form of violation. So the Office of Civil Rights is the investigative branch for HIPAA. They are legally obligated to follow up on absolutely any reported incident. So they get in, they take a look at it. You have to be able to respond within 10 days to any request for information. And usually what happens is the initial response is inadequate. So they reach out, they ask what happened, they take a look at your stuff, or there's been an actual breach, they come in and they begin this audit, this investigation. Most healthcare organizations are simply not prepared for this. And without strong preparation, without having the organization in the back end ahead of time, it's almost impossible to put this stuff together in the time frame that you've got under audit. And that, that's the thing. I mean, you look at online, just, just to put things in perspective, how many times have you been corrected for your grammar online? Not because the person was that, you know, fervent or passionate about what they were talking about. They're just that kind of person that wants to correct anything that they perceive to be wrong. And it just takes that one call, that one report saying, I saw, uh, I saw a log form with patient data on the receptionist's desk, and I don't feel that, shouldn't have been, that should have been there. And that's enough, right? That's enough to spawn an audit. 100%. That is enough to spawn an investigation, which then leads to an audit. That is exactly how it begins. And, and you, you, we, we keep touching on like, why, right? Why are all these people failing so badly? I believe it's a language problem. I believe that, that we as service providers, even internal IT, speak a different language than our client. And so we go in and let's say, you know, you're an MSP and you go in and you talk to a doctor. You've got a good security solution for them. You've got all these tools, you know how to deliver it. And what you do is you go in and say, I've got HIPAA compliant security tools I want to put in place to make all your systems secure and compliant. Problem though. Really two problems. One, a thing, a, a system, a software, a tool is never compliant or non-compliant. The organization themselves are either compliant or non-compliant. The other thing is you're talking about security. So you're sitting there saying to your customer, I'm going to imp implement security. And what you mean is a whole bunch of nerd stuff that, again, they don't understand. You mean EDR, MDR, managed encryption, backup, disaster recovery, blah, blah, blah. Your customer heard you say, I'm going to make you safe. I'm gonna build you a house, give you a place where you can sleep tonight and nothing bad is gonna to happen to you. So you said security and they heard safety. There's a big difference in the two words, right? Security was, was applying to a very specific section of their organization. To them though, safety means all of it. That means their business is gonna be okay because they hired you. Now the fallout from this can be really bad. If you as a service provider stop at the security and they think you are gonna make them safe and later the audit happens and they fail it, they're going to blame you because they didn't understand in the beginning that there was a limited deliverable you promised. You were just talking about security and they thought it was so much more. That's what leads to these audits. See, they have a service provider now, they have a local IT guy, their nephew down the street comes in and cleans up their computers, whatever that is, they're not willingly negligent. They think what they're doing is enough. Somebody told them that what they put in, that firewall is HIPAA compliant, or they bought all Windows 10 this year, so it's no longer, you know, seven, therefore they're compliant, right? And that compliance equates in their mind to that security in ours, which equals safety. The problem is, if you put in a bunch of security tools, you've fixed some of their problem, but you haven't made them safe. As a matter of fact, 70 plus percent of the time, your tools can't really prevent the issue. The end user did something wrong. They were poorly trained. The laptop was stolen. Uh, they clicked on a bad email. They deliberately disabled a feature that's protecting them. Human error causes a tremendous amount of the breaches that we see that end up in these fines and these audits. And kind of a scary factor, a lot of times that human error is the IT team themselves, the MSP the techs that work for them, the internal IT department, that nephew down the street that came in and did this stuff. See, we again, kind of misled the client and said, if the tools are in place, you're safe. 
but we didn't count on the human factor. We're not addressing the administrative stuff. And at the end of the day, we on our side, if we're not doing like keeping our house clean, we're exposing them to risk from our own staff, from our own team members. So that's really what leads to this massive failure rate is there's a disconnect in communication and a lack of understanding what it really takes to comply with the law. For example, Everybody out there is, is so concerned about COVID that right now we are glued to our screens, staring, waiting for another news release. We're waiting to find out when we get to leave our houses and when our kids get to go back to school, our businesses fire back all the way up and run like normal. So the bad guys are taking advantage of this. They're sending out massive sets of emails campaigns, all these phishing attacks that are designed to trick your customer, not just to hack their computer, but to give them their information, to willingly hand over the keys to that city that your tools are designed to protect, right? So at the end of the day, while security tools and the apps themselves can can help you have to be able to deal with the human factor here to truly make that client safe and make them compliant so i think you had another poll here right we do have another poll here absolutely uh let me get the polling going and so poll number two our question for poll number two is does your company conduct on-site scans? So we have all these tools for, I'm not talking about the firewall tools or rapid fire, or, you know, those, those tools. I'm talking about go out in person, checklist in hand, face-to-face, -face, shaking hands, kissing babies. Are you doing on-site scans? I'm um, seeing about 55%. Oh, it keeps bouncing back and forth. We're split almost 50-50 at this point, whether it's yes or no. Uh, I'll give a few more seconds because I still see people voting. Um, what's your, uh, until we get those results, what's your uh, stance, Paul? Are they so required? We believe that vulnerability scans are mandated under the law. It's, it's becoming more clear as technology moves forward. If you backed up three or four years ago, HHS said address and look at your vulnerabilities. As they continue to release publications and clarity, what we're seeing is, you know, look, the reality is we are all tied to computer systems. If these things are not patched and properly maintained, they create giant risks and huge holes inside these businesses. You are required under the law to do a risk assessment at least annually on your entire organization. And I think it's ineffective or impossible, honestly, to say that you can do a risk assessment and not do vulnerability scans. I don't, I don't know how you can tell me how high the risk is for my laptop that I'm doing this on today if we haven't scanned it at all to tell me whether or not it's patched and all the security features are in place so i'm seeing here uh and now keep in mind we we saw in the beginning the majority of our group was saying they offer HIPAA hipaa compliance solutions i'm seeing here 52 percent are actually doing on-site surveys so there's a disparity there right between the majority of the group doing hipaa but only half actually doing on-site you know and what you're saying is you need to be on site whether it's once a year or more and, and i would argue more um you know you need to be going out and doing on site, you know, um, so, you know, some of the comments I'm seeing here in the chat are actually bringing up excellent points. You know, I'm seeing it's good to be, Jason brings up an excellent point. Forget the HIPAA side of it, which is obviously the point of this call, but it's good to be visible to the client in the process, right? They, they want to see you're not just running some stuff remotely, but why you're there. And we had a talk with Lifecycle Insights about QBRs. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of QBRs and getting in front of the client. Um, you know, and some of us only go on site to close that deal, but we need to do this to maintain compliance too. So keep that in mind. Agreed. And if you're not, who is? You know, if you, yeah, I, think, exactly. I think that's an, that's another thing to point out here is you can't assume that this client even understands they're supposed to be looking in their trash cans every year for, for PHI. You know what I mean? The physical side of it, I don't know how many medical organizations realize a fire extinguisher is a required thing in your business for HIPAA compliance. It goes beyond wow. that. Wow. So what is actually required, right? It, it, it's it, the, again, the law doesn't call out these specific tech tools. What they're saying is that you have to have controls in place, the access controls, right? So this is the way that we allow our customers to interact with their computers for multi-factor authentication or strong password policies, all the way into the control over, you know, need to know basis within an organization, what our techs have access to ourselves, right? Audit controls. This is a big one for the service provider. 
that guy that's doing purely break fix can't really help these people achieve compliance with the law because if I only come in today and I only fix what's wrong and I don't come back until something's wrong again, who has been auditing and monitoring the system that I dropped off last time, right? This is an active thing. You simply can't turn on a system and say, whoo, now I'm HIPAA compliant and I'm safe. Let's move on till next year. A culture of compliance is a living, breathing thing and auditing, auditing and monitoring are a core functionality of that piece. BDR, and I think is real, real quick, sorry to cut you off, but one of the things I think gets missed also is that, you know, it's not just the MSP's job here on the HIPAA side. You need, you need adoption from the client themselves. They need somebody that's a champion internally, right? It, it's not just the MSP doing this. And if you don't have that person on the other side, uh, it's not going to work. You know, it's funny that that is a, that is a real pain point when you deal with some of the smaller clients, because if you, if you expect the client to do all of this themselves, everything other than the IT side, and nobody's holding their hand, it is so daunting that they simply pass that responsibility. But in order to comply with the law, you have to have a compliance officer. Like I have a right to call your organization and say, hey, this is Paul Redding. I would like to talk to your compliance officer. You have to be able to tell me who that person is and put me in contact with them. So yes, not only should you put someone as an internal champion, somebody that's really going through this process and, and backed you up on this, but legally speaking, somebody there has to be aware of the overall corporate stance as it relates to compliance and moving that ball forward. It is an internal function that must be maintained by the business. And that, that compliance officer has to be an employee, right? It can't be the MSP. So yes, that is correct. Inside the organization, someone there has to be assigned this role. The MSP can be the virtual CISO. There are many, many roles that you can play, but at the end of the day, someone, and if it's a single person mental health professional, then they themselves must be the compliance officer. It's a mandated role. That's a really good question. Uh, other things that, you know, I won't dig into so much here, but let's just talk about what's required and, and why I say that, you know, compliance really justifies and mandates what you're putting out there. Business continuity and disaster recovery. Guys, if you closed for COVID and you went home for three to four weeks and there is no way for your medical clients to be able to get their PHI from you or request their medical records, you are going to be audited and fined severely. The, remember that group I said that investigates you, right? That's the Office of Civil Rights. You have a civil right to both privacy and access to your medical records, which means server crashes, natural disasters, act of God, pandemic, whatever, you have to be able to put this stuff out. So for the normal business, BDR is a good idea. For healthcare, it is absolutely mandated under the law, as is endpoint protection and contract management. So let me ask a quick question, and, and I realize this topic could be a whole separate webinar by itself, but in the face of, of this pandemic route now, you know, we have more and more healthcare workers that are being forced to work from home, and maybe not the entire office, but a good portion of the office, if not the entire office. How do they handle this? Because we don't have all those tools at their home offices. How, how is, you know, how is HSS uh, looking at this? So you, you were correct the first time. That is an entirely separate webinar, which we just recently did and, and are happy to uh, share some links to. But it, it is not as easy as we want it to be, right? The, the While, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but recently uh, they have relaxed a little bit of the guidelines around what tools can be used for telehealth, right? So before you had to use specific Zoom SKUs, for example, if you were in HIPAA, they've relaxed that a little bit and allowed uh, a little more, more latitude with what tools you use specifically for that telehealth piece. Nothing else has been relaxed whatsoever. So the devices that are at home must be capable of being logged, monitored, and audited. You have to have strong password policies. The basics of HIPAA compliance must be maintained at your house. We have a tool for our partners to use to help your clients assess this, but it's absolutely critical that when you send these folks home, you do it properly, which is now, we're going to assess this environment. This is how far we take it. And obviously we understand that it's a different world, right? We're not expecting every single customer everywhere to have a you know, HIPAA compliant firewall at their home, but that's why God invented the VPN, right? You know, there, there are things that have to be done to, in order to comply and working from home despite the pandemic does not alleviate you of, of your responsibilities to achieve compliance with the law. 
So we keep talking about it. And this slide shows a little off to the right. It should say security. <laughs> Compliance and security here <laughs> are two very, very different things, okay? Compliance is about achieving uh, what the, the letter of the law. So it's technologically vague because what did we say earlier? It's written for the smallest organization up to the largest organization. Also compliance is binary. It's either yes or no. This is the rule. Do you do this? If your answer is no, then you're out of compliance and you're subject to fines. It also affects everybody inside your organization. So while security might only apply at various stages to different groups from the lowest employee all the way up to the CEO, everyone inside a healthcare or related organization is responsible for helping that business maintain compliance with the law. So really, if you think about it, compliance is designed to keep you from getting fined. It's supposed to keep you out of jail. It's supposed to keep money in your pocket. It doesn't keep you safe. It keeps you from being fined. Security, on the other hand, is risk management. It's really what it boils down to, right? Figuring out what your client's risk profile is, how big the attack surface is, how big the target, determining their budget, how far they can push it, what they can afford, right? Because I, I say it all the time, you really have enough security when you run out of money, but everybody runs out of money at a different rate. We can't expect, you know, I, I'll take two big ones, right? Nike and Boeing are two of the largest corporations in the world, but Nike is going to spend less on IT security because they make tennis shoes and Boeing makes rocket ships, right? But if it were compliance, if we were looking at it from a compliance perspective, the law would be equal for both of them. So you have to decide. So security is shades of gray. And it's controlled by your skill set, right? So it's we can only do what we can. You, you're supposed to try to secure the environment. But again, from the very beginning, it, it's true. If somebody wants you bad enough, they might get you. So if you think about it, if compliance is about preventing yourself from being fined, security boils down to risk management. Now, let's stop. And go back to that slide a while ago where we said, what did the client ask us for? We said, we're going to make you secure. They heard, you're going to make me safe. Give me a peace of mind, a home to live in. You know, nothing bad's going to happen to me. It takes both compliance and security to deliver safety. Okay? You have to comply with the law or you're at risk of fines. You have to try to protect the flag or some hacker, some script kitty is going to come rip you off. If you put both of those into a bundle as a service provider, deliver that, you can give them that safety. Because remember, compliance mandated all the security you were trying to put in place. If you start with compliance, you will be able to make the house more secure. And that's what we believe the MSP should be doing. If you take my example, going back, you know, years and looking what I did for a very long time, I, I ran what I call a very unsuccessful MSP. I went out and sold three little packages. I had like bronze, silver, and gold. And in bronze was a little bit of stuff. And in silver was a little bit more stuff. And in gold was everything I thought you were supposed to really have to truly be safe and be able to run your business efficiently, right? Well, what did I end up selling? 80% of the time, it was either bronze or silver because nobody wanted to pay for absolutely everything in the bucket. But my sales cycles were long. And, and ultimately, I believe that's because I was speaking a different language than my customer. I'm there talking about security. They hear safety. I try to explain that my tech is bigger than his tech and you're supposed to pay more for it. And they just tore things away. I gave them a list of like line items they didn't understand. They said, ooh, I don't want to pay that much. Remove some of this nerd stuff and this is how much I'm willing to pay. When I moved and I began to sell compliance first and I began to explain to the client what they really needed. You need to be safe. You need to be secure. You need to be compliant. You need for your employees to understand their job. You need to assess your risk. Once you put it in the right perspective and understand and let them understand, I'm here to build you a house. I'm here to give you absolutely everything that you need in order to comply with the law. They realize a, one, a single solution is what they're looking for. They just didn't understand it before. And that single solution addresses all of their problem. Remember I said it's not compliance as a service, it's as a solution. We take all the problems, we put them into one thing, we knock it all out at once. It simplifies your sales offering, right? So I'm not sitting here explaining EDR, MDR, SOC, SIM, fill in your acronym, right? I didn't have line items. 
because you didn't ask me for a stack of tools, you asked me to build a house, so I'm only delivering a single solution. And if you take my example, I actually built that solution by going back to my engineers and saying, guys, what should be an absolutely every client environment? Ground up, tell me what our customer is supposed to look like. Price, all of that out of the question. You guys tell me, you're the ones that have to secure the flag, you're the ones that support it, what do I sell? Once they gave me that and I wrap it all up with the law, it's the only thing that I'm selling. So it makes that sales cycle faster and more simple. You nailed something earlier. You're not going to win every customer and you don't want every customer, right? By simplifying the sales offer and giving them a single solution with a high value proposition, you separate the wheat from the chaff. The ones that get it and want to live in that house, well, hey, get on board, guys. They're going to respect you. They're going to work with you over time the other guy still exists and they did for me all the way through. I still had the person that I put all this together, I explained everything we're talking about and I said, look man, I'm gonna do all this for you in a single solution and it's only 175 bucks a user a month. I'm gonna be honest. The conversation didn't always go, great Paul, I'm gonna pay for that right now. As a matter of fact, some people would look at you and say, Paul, I like everything that you've set up till now. You don't sound like any IT provider I've ever met, and I think you really understand my business. But dude, you said 175 bucks a user. My current guy is 100. You split the difference with me, give it to me at 135 and we got a deal. When I was that IT provider out there just bundling up my tools into silver, bronze and gold, all I said was, uh, okay man, that's my silver offering, right? So I'm gonna remove this, remove that, remove this and that's what you get. But I'm building you a house, doc. You tell me, man. I'm going to keep building and you're going to arbitrarily stick your hands in my bucket over here and take a stack of boards and nails away that you don't understand even where they go. So I'll keep building, but where does the hole go? Do you want it in the floor, the wall, or the ceiling? Better yet, Doc, what do you want in your house? Snakes, bugs, or rain? Something's going to get in. Well, and I think you're, you're skipping over something really, really, really important. Actually, everything you're saying is important, of course, but you know, in that previous slide you had with the different MRR ranges, you know, you said it yourself, you're selling a bunch of the basic managed security, you know, and you're closing more of those a lot faster, but that bottom line, that net profit of 30 to 50%, even if you take that higher class customer, which is the only thing we ever had offered, you know, at, at, at the end of it, um, you know, we we're taking new customers, but even the higher end offer, you had to do four of those little ones to make up for the profit for the 200% profit of that one big one. So if it took a little longer, you're doing a little bit longer, but for the same amount of effort, probably arguably less effort because those bigger clients are easier, the ones you, you're providing whole stack, you're getting four times the profit. And I think that's something MSPs miss. Um, we're, at the, we're at 10 minutes before the hour, so 11 minutes before the hour, so I know we got a few slides left, so I'll shut up. But I do have a, a good list of questions here uh, we want to get through as well, just yeah. letting you know. So actually, you know what, I, I, at the end, we really only have the last one. What is it, what do we do, where do you fit in? Okay guys, if you are an MSP, where you are living is on the left over here. You do your security risk assessments, you fix the IT issues, and you might be providing some basic training or templated policies. Working with the compliance group, what you are allowing yourself to do is bring in us as a third party to do absolutely everything else and to take the work that you've done and import it into our system so it goes from tickets that can be tracked to actual remediation work required under the law. We are going to pick up that client. My people are going to hold their hand and take them all the way through this process from beginning to end, step by step, from building their policies and procedures, addressing their incident management, training their employees, and ultimately, at each, at each uh, turn, we're going to look to you to tell us what their security risk profile is, what tools should go in place. So it's like a partnership where we pick up all the compliance, you do all the security, and both of us together provide that house that client wants to live in. One of the first questions came in from Coleman Groves. Can you address how we position the SRA versus what's in the guard? And for those that don't know, the, the SRA from HSS is the security risk assessment. And you have a, a nice blog on here about the updated SRS, SRA that was posted out there, sorry. Um, but can you discuss that, you know, how to position the SRA versus what's in the guard? And what is the guard? Uh, yeah. So the guard is, a, the, guard is the, the tool that we use to deliver this, right? Think 
QuickBooks for HIPAA compliance. It's a software as a service solution that we use to track all the work that's been done, input all the policies and procedures, manage your risk assessments, and handle all your vendor stuff. Your risk assessment, the template for it, the questions that need to be asked from the like IT security risk assessment side are there in the guard. We're going to give that to you, tell you the questions that need to be addressed and go through it with you and let you do that with your client. But so are all the other audits. See, the, the security risk assessment is only one of the audits required under the law. My team is actually going to work with your client to perform, let's say, the high-tech subtitle D privacy audit while you guys are doing the risk assessment. So the risk assessment, to answer your question, is right, and it's a critically important piece of this. It's just one-third of one of the rules, and it's just one of the audits that has to be performed. We're going to help them do all of those. Okay, uh, excellent answer. So I'll give you a little bit of a softball here because I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but uh, Jason Richmond is asking, he's one of our MSP partners, does Compliancy Group do a sales help for those of, that are new to the product and it's sale? For example, are you guys willing to do a Zoom with them and their client and their sales reps? I, I think you might want to talk about the engagement Compliancy Group's offers. It's not just a here, go. You guys are much more involved in that, right? Yeah, as a matter of fact, we have a program that we start everybody on. We call it guided fishing, right? So the way that this system works, you have to achieve compliance first. When you become our partner, we're going to put you through the process. It's five to eight meetings with a coach. It takes about 30 minutes per meeting. You'll get a couple hours of homework in between each where you do your risk assessment, you address your, your contracts, all that stuff. While that goes on, though, it doesn't mean that you can't actually create revenue out of compliance. You're going to be assigned an account manager. This is a dedicated resource for you and go through what we call our guided phishing program. This is look at your existing client base. Introduce them to us by saying, we want you to evaluate this fabulous solution and learn more about HIPAA. My guy is going to get on the phone with you. He's going to do a, a go to meeting or a Zoom meeting with your client. Let them speak the language of compliance while you sit back and listen. I, I call it guided fishing because, you know, first time I go to any big lake, I may not catch anything all day. I know how to fish. I don't know how to fish here. If you let my people talk to your clients for you, then you have the ability to sit back, let them create revenue, and you'll learn the language. You'll hear us overcome objections. But, yes, we are very active in the sales process. You always have our resource to go directly to a client. Awesome. So one of the questions here from Baron Williams uh, and I, I think this is one that's maybe best left to offline. I'll make sure you have his contact information. But he asked, how do you recommend we approach a healthcare provider? Would we like to start, they, they would like to start providing HIPAA compliance uh, services. Um, you touched on some of that just now and that, you know, how you're willing to engage. Um, but Baron, I think we're going to, I would just want to make sure you knew we were going to answer you. But I think that's something maybe Paul or his staff would best answer offline. Um, I can do a real quick one word answer. Yeah, go ahead. It begins with education. The, the, you don't want to scare the hell out of everybody. You don't want to run around and freak everybody out. Just start by explaining what it actually takes to achieve compliance. All of our sales pitches and everything that we do begins with an educational pitch. Like, hey, let us just explain to you what's really going on here. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so Jason, and you touched on this about HSS relax, relaxing the, uh, the rules a little bit. Um, but Jason asks, if the home PC is only remote controlling the compliant PC in the office, file sharing disabled, is HIPAA control, are HIPAA controls required for the home PC? And I'll, I'll expand upon that. VDI, desktop as a service, remote desktop, cloud. I mean, those were already, you know, fastly growing in our, our industry, but it's exploded in the last couple of weeks with this, this pandemic stuff going on. Um, do we need the same controls on those devices if they're just dumb terminals at that point, connecting via screen connect or take control or something like that? Mm, so it's a loaded question, right? There's a difference between a dumb terminal and a Windows machine that's using RDP. So in the case of a dumb terminal, there's not a whole lot to protect. And yeah, you, you can live without a lot of the major controls. In the case of Windows, Mac, whatever, you can, as long as you have file share and all those things disabled, so you cannot pull PHI down, rules like encryption could be maybe negated. And there are many 
security things that you can maybe look past. But at the end of the day, you have to be able to prove that the host machine that you're working from doesn't have a keylogger on it, doesn't have some kind of malware, isn't doing something to actually capture all these sessions. So there are some pretty core security requirements that you cannot step around. It's not a, it's not a full blown, every home has to be like the office, but it's not a just because you're getting working from home and you're using RDP means no security at all. So it's a absolutely. Balance. I mean, the way the way we always looked at it as MSP, if you have access to walk through the front door, either with a key or because you broke the window and got in, you have to be protected against it. So whether it's a home PC, whether it's a BYOD cell phone, it has to have some level of protection, some level of counting, authentication, authorization. Um, you can't just assume it's a home device, so don't worry about it. Um, you know, even with the best of intentions. So. Uh, oh, and Jason says, awesome answer to the home PC question, by the way. Um, oh, thank you. Thanks, Jason. Okay, so the next three questions are going to be telco related um, because compliance group doesn't have just, you know, MSPs are a major part of your offering, but that's not just the only people. You guys have been doing compliance for a long time with all industries, oh, yeah. right? So, you know, our white label partners are, and our other NetSapiens partners that are out there, um, they're asking some telco questions. So first and foremost, I'm Brian asks, I'm curious about the need for BAA with a VoIP provider. Is that something explicitly required? Generally, yes. Um, there are exceptions. So for example, um, if your VoIP provider is only giving you an on-premise you know what I mean? Like an on-prem device, you are solely managing it, or they gave you a VM that you are completely hosting. They have no access whatsoever. Nah, not necessarily. But you have to look at the support factor, right? So 90% of your VoIP suppliers and 90% of your VoIP agents are going to be able to go in there and help you with that PBX. That includes things like retrieving voicemail or messaging or any of that stuff this is where all your PHI lives. So if your provider or is capable of doing that, or if you as a provider are capable of touching or any interacting in any way with the actual call data, the messaging data, the recordings, yes, you are a business associate and you have to sign a business associate agreement to work with them. Absolutely. And for those, I'll be a little self-serving for those OIT VoIP customers, either white label or uh, channel partner. And Jason just asked, Yes, we absolutely will sign a BA uh, without question. Email compliance at oat.co and uh, our uh, operations department will get you taken care of. For the white label partners that are using our ancillary services, we do have BAAs with our upstream providers absolutely in place, uh, and we will sign BAs over to you. Um, but with the white label, it's on you to sign your BAs with your clients. Um, so absolutely. So uh, ask another question here from Ozzy, uh, my buddy's up in Jersey. Um, I was asking how many touch points should a, hold on, sorry, the questions are kind of going all over the place. How many touch points should a telecom service provider be aware of for potential HIPAA non-compliance? So it's some gray area, right? We're not managing the network. We're not managing the client. We're providing voice services in a hosted environment. Where do, where do the lines lie, right? Where, where's, <laughs> where is that, that definition? It's actually easier to answer than you would think. So the way that a business associate agreement works is it says we cannot share liability. What you can control and what you can be responsible for is 100% on you and everything that I can control and that I'm responsible for is 100% on me. So as a VoIP provider, you are responsible for your phone system your own internal compliance, maintaining the BAAs with that client, and any privacy or administrative pieces associated with it, like what you allow your employees to see or interact with, for example. Like that's all your responsibility. You, if you are not providing their switches and firewalls and access points and the computer support and all that stuff on the inside, have no responsibility there whatsoever. Your client is signing a BA with you that says, I'm taking care of my stuff, you take care of yours. It's when you're the MSP and you are responsible for both that it's a larger issue, right? A lot of MSPs are selling voice services, in which case you're on both sides of that table. Which sometimes can be a little easier to control. <laughs> so if you have the whole, Correct. The whole enchilada. Sure. Um, so, and there's a, Ozzy asked another question. And you answered some of it. What should be in every hosted PBX provider's uh, offering related to HIPAA? Um, I think maybe we can work together to establish a checklist or something. Compliancy Group, and, and tell me if I'm misspeaking, but Compliancy Group absolutely works with telco providers 
to oh, yeah. Yeah. offer compliance services and help engage their customers. Um, you know, so I'll make sure we share that contact information, Ozzy, but maybe we can uh, work together offline to create a checklist. Uh, yeah, yeah, that'd be fabulous. High level a great stuff. Idea. I think it's a great idea. It's a question that we get a lot because your responsibilities are different than other people's. It, it's it, it, there's a lot of gray and and the true telco providers you know have a range. Absolutely. And with that, I will let everybody go. I just want to remind everybody. I'll uh, go ahead, go ahead and uh, share real quick. Uh, first and foremost, Paul, thank you so much, man. It's been a, an absolute pleasure. HIPAA comes up so often. Uh, so many questions we get asked on a regular basis. Um, you know, I will share the, the contact information also. Uh, this recording will be available later uh, for anybody that needs, but Paul's uh, contact information is there. Guys, also, don't forget, we are having another webinar. We usually do these monthly, but uh, we're going to go ahead and do this, uh, this one. We're going to do a, a, a second one uh, off the cuff with Ernest Murray. He's a CEO and founder of Genuine uh, Technology. Um, if you're in our communities, if you're in the Facebook groups and Discord, IT Pool Party, you know who Ernest is. Um, Ernest is one of our buddies that do uh, best practices. He's the one we always go to for SOPs and checklists. Uh, we have 7,000 articles on our documentation platform. He probably trumps ours. Uh, he's going to share with us how he's doing remote deployment, zero touch, distributor to client, and it's getting them onboarded seamlessly using Microsoft Intune and Autopilot. Um, something in today's day and age, I think we can all appreciate. Um, but with that, you know, this is the link and we will share it out to everybody that joined us today. Um, but everybody, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Paul, thank you, man. It's It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been awesome having you on. Thank you for your time. Ray, I couldn't uh, appreciate it more, man. We really uh, enjoyed the opportunity to come talk to your folks today. And I hope I provided some insight. I look forward to working with you again, man. Stay safe and well, everybody. It's a weird out there. <laughs> it's a weird one. All right. Take care, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, guys. Thanks for watching. For more videos just like this one, hit the subscribe button. Don't forget to hit the alert icon so you get notified of new videos or check out some of these videos below.